Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all for coming today. Uh, it is truly a pleasure to be here to give the final lecture of Hillary term. Today is the 8th of March, the International Women's Day, and therefore I thought it would be only fitting to give a talk focus on Luthien Tenuviel, one of the most important of Tolkien's female characters. But Tolkien himself considered the chief of the stories of the Silmarillion, and one of the most fully treated to be the story of Beren and Luthien the Elf Maiden, and that this story was a fundamental link in the cycle. Today's lecture will be considering two topics. First, the respective fates of men and elves in Tolkien's Legendarium, and the relationship between their hroar, their bodies, and their fjær, their minds or souls. And secondly, we'll be looking at the impacts of the interracial relationship between Beren and Luthien, on Arda Tolkien's world. Uh, in our exploration of these topics, we will not only study Beren and Luthien's story, but we will also consider some lesser known texts, such as the Atrabeth Finrod a Andres and the tale of Adonel. The inclusion of these texts in our discussion will help us come to a fuller understanding of the disparate fates of elves and men and the exceptional um, nature of what comes, to become, what comes to become known as Luthien's choice. And so, first we'll be introducing Beren and Luthien before looking at death in Tolkien's Arda, looking at some of the metaphors for death and the contrasting nature of man of man, before looking at Luthien's choice in the halls of Mandals, before we come to a very short conclusion. But before we explore the theological doctrines uh, surrounding the fates of men and elves in detail, let's further explore some uh, Beren and Luthien and their story within the wider Tolkien, with, um, within the wider legendarium and in Tolkien's primary world as well. So, first a short plot summary of Beren and Luthien. Luthien is actually the original half-elven, daughter of the elf king Thingol of Doriath and the Maya Melian. Meanwhile, uh, Beren is a mortal man and his family, uh, the House of Beor, are known in Beleriand as elf friends. The complex tale of their love for each other and the quest they are forced to embark upon is a story of triumph against overwhelming odds, and it, but it ends in tragedy. Luthien's father Thingol tells Beren that the hand of Luthien can on, cannot be his until he brings back a Silmaril from the crown, crown of Morgoth, the original master of Sauron. On his quest, quest Beren is aided by both Luthien and Finrod Falagund, the brother of Galadriel, and a name worth keeping in mind because we will come across him several times later in this talk. Uh, the quest, although successful, first leads to the loss of Beren's hand and then later of his life. Uh, after Beren's untimely death, Luthien passes away from grief and then enters the, the halls of Mandos. There she sings a song so sorrowful that she moves the Vala Mandos himself, the god of death, to pity. The unique choice then offered to Luthien is between living in Valinor without Beren or to divest herself of immortality and return to Middle-earth with Beren, thus becoming a mortal. And she chooses the latter and thus becomes the first elf to share in the fate of men and she's then returned to life. For those with intimate knowledge of the Lord of the Rings, the story of Beren and Luthien might be familiar as their as a summary of their tale is recounted by Aragorn to the hobbits in the chapter A Knife in the Dark in the Fellowship of the Ring. Besides, there are numerous links, parallels and references to the tale of Beren and Luthien throughout the Lord of the Rings as offered by the characters themselves. The story of the first elf human marriage is also mirrored in the relationship of Aragorn and Arwen in the Third Age. The story of Beren and Luthien went throughout several iterations uh, which can be traced throughout the history of the Middle-earth. Uh, the 12-volume series of books that collect and analyze Tolkien's out-of-universe history um, and his creative process throughout. The first version of Beren and Luthien is called The Tale of Tenuviel and was written in 1917 and published in The Book of Lost Tales, Part 2, in 1984. During the 1920s, Tolkien began reshaping the tale into an epic called The Lay of Luthien, pieces of which became incorporated in The Lord of the Rings. Unfortunately, he never finished the epic, leaving three out of 17 cantos unwritten. 
Uh, but after his death, the epic was published in the History of Middle Earth, Volume 3, called The Lays of Beleriand. The story is also mentioned in the Grey Annals in, volume, in The War of the Jewels from 1994. And the latest, latest version of the tale is told in prose form in the posthumous Silmarillion from 1977. The, these various iterations were finally collected in Christopher Tolkien's Beren and Luthien and published in 2017. Meanwhile, in the primary world, Tolkien met his own Luthien, Edith Meyer Brett, in 1908. Like their fictional uh, namesakes, the couple were kept apart by stipulation by Tolkien's legal guardian. The couple later married in, in 1916 after reuniting in 1913. Uh, after Edith's death in 1971, when considering adding the epitaph of Luthien to his wife's grave, Tolkien explained to Christopher, his son, in a letter that the epitaph says for me more than a multitude of words, for she was and knew she was my Luthien. A couple of days later, in the same letter, he then clarifies that I never called Edith Luthien, but she was the source of the story that in time became the chief part of the Silmarillion. It was first conceived in a small woodland glade filled with hemlocks at Bruce in Yorkshire. In those days, her hair was raven, uh, her skin clear, her eyes brighter than you have seen them, and she could sing and dance. But the story has gone crooked, and I am left, and I cannot plead before the inexorable Mandos. The image of the separation of Beren and Luthien through death and the inverse timeline of their departure when applied to Tolkien and Edith's real-life relationship is highlight highlighted twice in Tolkien's letters. The first passage, which you can now see on screen, highlights the inspiration of the living Edith on Luthien's character, with a short mention of Tolkien's grief explained through the inability to plead for her return in the halls of Mandos. Meanwhile, the second passage is even more vivid in the focus of a the lack of a happy ending for the primary world of Beren and Luthien. Tolkien explains that now she has gone before Beren, leaving him indeed one-handed, but he has no power to move the inexorable Mandos, and there is no Dorgir Equinar, the land of the dead that live, in this fallen kingdom of Arda, where the servants of Morgoth are worshipped. For Tolkien, there is no Mandos who can be pleaded with and moved to pity, no land to which they can return to live out the rest of their lives together. The primary world, Beren and Luthien, sharing the fate of all mortals in this primary world, were to remain apart until they were reunited beyond the confines of the world. Tolkien's Beren uh, ended up joining his Luthien a short uh, 21 months later in 1973. Now, the topic of death was one which preoccupied Tolkien greatly. Not only was he intimately familiar with it, having lost both his mum and dad at a young age and having taken part in the infamously bloody Battle of the Somme during the First World War, but it arose as one of the core themes of his own legendarium. This is a point he makes repeatedly in several of his letters. He says that the real theme for me is about something much more permanent and difficult, death and immortality. The mystery of the love of the world in the, heart, in the hearts of a race doomed to leave and seemingly lose it, and the anguish in the hearts of a race doomed not to leave it until the, its whole evil aroused story is complete. And this sentiment, uh, death and immortality, or a desire for death, deathlessness, is repeated another three times in letters 203, 208, and 211. All three quotes, as you can now see on the screen, discuss The Lord of the Rings, published between 1954 and 1955, part of the period in which Tolkien's ideas concerning death were stabilizing. However, death is not only a main theme in The Lord of the Rings. In fact, he kept developing the theme of death all throughout his creative career, from 1917 to 1973. His legendarium is a true meditatio mortis, a, medit a meditation on death for the contemporary man, as outlined by Claudio Testi in his very helpful study on the development of the theme across Tolkien's legendarium. Later in his career, Tolkien even brought philosophical treatises and debates concerning death, con usually composed between 1957 and 1960 which served as the highest point of Tolkien philosophical thought. 
In this section, um, Death in Tolkien's Arda, we will con be considering some of the principal texts which he composed in this period, primarily the Atrapeth Finrod a Andres. But before we introduce the Atrapeth, what does Tolkien actually mean when he refers to death? Death in Tolkien's secondary world refers to A, the separation of Froa, body, and Fea, spirit, and B, the departure of the Fea from the confines of Arda. Death is thus considered the destruction of the physical form with the spirit leaving the body. What distinguishes the sentient races of elves and men in Tolkien's secondary world is the degree to which their physical forms are susceptible to death and, their destination, and the destination of their spirits after their body is slain. Then let, well, let's look at immortality, which Tolkien also calls the lim limitless serial longevity. Immortality is restricted to those beings whose spirits remain in the world after their bodies are slain, such as elves, Valar, or Maiar. These are beings of the world, and their fate and the fate of the world are linked. None of them can ever experience true death like men by leaving Arda itself. Like the greatest spirits, such as the Valar or the Maiar, um, the elves do not die naturally. Their physical forms may be slain, uh, thus experiencing a form of death, like the separation of Froa and Fea, but they do not leave this world. Uh, if slain, they go to the halls of Mandos, where they dwell for a while until they are reborn into new bodies. Elves are therefore immortal, uh, though they are not true immortals. Only Eru Ilúvatar, the one god, and the unincarnated Ainur are truly immortal. Meanwhile, men do indeed die fully and experience both forms of death, both the severing of the Hroa and Fea and the departure beyond Arda. Neither elves nor men know where men depart to uh, after they're dead. Uh, while other races share immortality, men have what the elves call the gift of Ilúvatar, death and mortality. And we will return to, this to the perceptions of this gift later, as it is one of the most intriguing of Tolkien's secondary world inventions. Yeah. Now, having established the outlines of what we mean by death, um, mortality and immortality, let's look at two major metaphors the Athrabeth employs to convey the different natures of men and elves, death the hunter and the house and the guest. But before we do that, what is actually the Atrabeth uh, that I keep referring to? The Atrabeth is a philosophical debate between an immortal elf and a mortal woman on the metaphysical differences between elves and men, the theme of death, and the imbalances between their fates. The debate can be found in Morgoth's Ring, the 10th volume of the History of Middle-earth, published in 1993, and it is a major and finished work, referred to otherwise in Tolkien's or elsewhere in Tolkien's notes from the same period as if it actually had some authority within his world. Christopher Tolkien believed that it was finished in 1959, and it was actually intended by Tolkien to be the final item in the appendices of the Silmarillion if he had managed to publish it himself. But unfortunately, it was not included in the posthumous work. Now, I know this one looks kind of terrifying, but we'll <laughs> go through it. Uh, the two speakers uh, of the Atrabeth are the wise woman Andres, that you can see over here. Uh, she's of the house of Beor, and she is the great aunt of Beren, who you can see here. Meanwhile, the second speaker is Fenrod Falgand. He is the brother of Galadriel and the king of Nargothrond, one of the major um, elven kingdoms from the First Age. Fenrod is considered the wisest of the exiled Noldor, and he was the first elf to encounter men when they first arrived in Beleriand. The Atrabeth takes place off takes place after the funeral of Andras' grandfather, Boron, over here. And the final revelation of the Atrabeth is the knowledge that, the inter that an interracial marriage almost took place uh, between the wise woman Andres, one of the speakers, and Fenrod's brother, Agnor, as well. Um, but that this was not but that this did not happen because at the time there was a great war going on and elves do not marry during times of war. 
Uh, while the relationship between Egnor and Andrat therefore did not occur, it is worth noting that Finrod later died during the quest of the Silmaril in protection of Beren and in fulfillment of an oath that he made to Beren's father, Barahir, whom he saved from certain death uh, at an early stage. In Tolkien's commentary to the Athrabeth, he makes the point that Finrod's uh, assistance was integral to the marriage of Beren and Luthien actually happening. Uh, unfortunately, even though unfortunately he did not live to see it happen. Now, <laughs> throughout their discussion, Fenrod and Andreth refer to, uh, to the death, the hunter, and the house, and the guest to explore various aspects of their disparate natures. The death, the hunter metaphor is primarily used to discuss the differences between immortality and mortality of elves and men, considering death a steadfast hunter stalking the fleeing hearts in his woods. Andreth explains man's relationship with death as the following, that the fear of death is with us always, and we, fear f uh, and we flee for from it ever as the heart from the hunter, and that death the hunter is someone they cannot, that cannot in the end be escaped. Be a man strong or swift or bold, be he wise or a fool, be he evil, evil or be he in all deeds of this day just and merciful, let him love the world or loathe it, he must die and leave it and become carrion that men are fain to hide and to burn. Death comes swiftly to men, but elves believe that this life continues for men beyond the confines, as we will explore shortly. On the other hand, Fenrod argues that the elves too, as immortals, are subject to the pursuit of death the hunter, and that they are aware of their own upcoming end, though it is still far off. Finrod likens the current state of the elves in the first age to the perception of death for a young man in his strength, that the end is still considered very remote. Unlike that young man, the elves already have long years of life and thought behind them, even at this early stage in their history. They are, however, fully aware of the following truth, that the end must come, that we all know, and then we must die. We must perish utterly, it seems, for we belong to Arda, Inhroa, and Fea. And beyond that, what? Our hunter is slow-footed, but he never loses the trail. Beyond the days when we shall blow the march, we have no certainty, no knowledge. The elves, knowing that they are part of the world, and knowing that the world will inevitably, inevitably come to an end, face the hunter they know they cannot escape, and which will destroy them completely. And there is no knowledge of what happens beyond, um, beyond the end. The second metaphor is the house and the indweller. Um, in the, and in the Athrabeth, Finrod explains that the Meruanwi are made of union of body and mind, of Froa and Fea, or as we say in the, or as we say in the picture of the house and the indweller. The core of this image, whether the spirits of elves and men are content within the world alone, is a topic of discussion both within the Athrabeth and in the Silmarillion. The main difference between the children of Ilovatar what concern, con um, concerns whether the indweller, the spirit, it seeks inwards, focusing all of their attention on the world as it is, or if it seeks outwards, beyond the confines of the world. So first, let's consider the elves. The spirit of elves, being immortal but confined to the world, are content within it. The spirit of elves being, um, there we go. Uh, <laughs> Tolkien himself argues that the elves have a devoted love of the physical world but a, and a desire to observe and understand it for its own sake. Uh, in the Silmarillion, it is revealed that Eru Ilúvatar, the one, describes the elves in the following words that the Quendi shall be the fairest of all earthly creatures, and they shall conceive and bring forth more beauty than all my children, and they shall have the greater bliss in the world. Meanwhile, later, the narrative presents the following description of the nature of the elves. And I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's rather long. Um, but it is said that uh, for the elves die not till the world dies, unless they are slain or waste in grief. And to both these seeming death, they are subject. Neither does age subdue their strength unless one grows weary of 10,000 centuries. 
and dying they are gathered to the halls of Mandos and Valinor, whence they may in time return. The first thing worth noting from this quote is the, are the words seeming deaths, when referring to elves dying of grief or being slain. Their bo elves' bodies are mortal and they can suffer a temporary separation of Froa and Fea, uh, so a form of death, but they are at their core immortal. The second aspect worth noting um, is the elves' capability for resurrection. Elves have one fear, one spirit, which is confined to the world. Their body too is of this world, and the Hroa is married to the fear. So therefore, when the incarnate forms are destroyed, they do not escape from time. In fact, the commentary to the Athra Beth explains that a houseless elvish fear must have the power or opportunity to return to life if it has the desire or will to do so. Now, secondly, let's consider the nature of men. The Silmarillion explains that the sons of men die indeed and leave the world, wherefore they are called guests or, or the strangers. While Eru will that elves should remain, like the Valar within the confines of the world, it is said that he will that the hearts of men should seek beyond the world and should find no rest therein. Arda is therefore not the permanent home of the spirits of men. In the Atrabeth, Finrod likens the restlessness of, men's fear, of a man's fear um, to the traveller in a strange land. To me, the difference seems uh, like that between one who visits a strange country and abides there for a while, but need not, and one who has lived in that land always and must. To the former, all things that he sees are new and strange, and in that degree, lovable. To the other, all things are familiar, the only things that are his own, and in that degree, precious. While elves are the local inhabitants, the men are seen as visitors to the world. Men are also made up of a single proa and a single fea, um, but their status of guests, but they are guests that depart from the world after their visit. Oh. Uh, this presents a curious issue regarding the relationship between body and spirit after death, when the body is then left behind. Andreth uh, explains that the body is not an inn to keep a traveler warm for the night, ere he goes on his way and then to receive another. It is a house made for one dweller only, indeed not only house, but raiment also. Therefore, man's nature is in disharmony when the body is left behind at the time of death. But why is this? The answer requires some further discussion concerning man's fallen state, the development of Tolkien's secondary theology, and the future of mankind in creation itself. Now, until 1958, Tolkien maintained that human death was both natural and in conformity with divine law. However, after 1958, Tolkien underwent an important development in his secondary theology and the writing of texts such as the Athrabeth in 1959. This development led him to distinguish between death as a severance of soul and body as being non-natural and not in conformity with Eru's um, uh, design but that death as a departure from the world being natural and in conformity with that design. Now, what does natural mean? Natural means what is inherent in their created beings, while what is in conformity is what adheres to the creative design of Eru. That man's nature um, is to depart from Arda remains cons constant even after Tolkien's revised theology in the Athra Beth. In fact, the elf-centered Silmarillion describes death as the gift of Ilvatar, which as time wears even the powers shall envy. Through their death, men might escape the bounds of Arda and then partake in God's divine plan beyond the music of the Ainur, <coughs> the song of creation which determined uh, the history of I Arda. It is said that men shall have the virtue to shape their life amid the powers and changes of the world beyond the music of the Ainur, which is as fate to all things else. And of their operation, everything should be in form indeed completed and the world fulfilled unto the 
last and smallest. Later, it is also said that the fate of men after death is not in the hands of the Valar, nor was all foretold in the music of the Ainur. While the elves may explore the music and unfold its beauty, men are given the ability to seek and discover more beyond. Their hearts are not nourished by the same music, the same creation that satisfies the elves and the Ainur, but from a place unknown to them. This is why their spirits cannot find satisfaction within Arda, but continuously seek beyond, continuously seeks beyond its limits. Death is therefore considered a gift, as it allows men to fulfill their purpose by joining Eru beyond the music, and possibly assisting him in the healing of the marring of Arda. According to Fenrod, this was already foreshadowed before their devising, and to do more as agents of the magnificence of Eru, to enlarge the music and surpass the vision of the world. Now, this is an interesting topic in its own right, uh, the one that I do not have time for and to explore further in this talk, but I am more than happy to answer any questions that you might have about it in the Q&A later. Now, um, secondly, Tolkien later argued that the severance of the body and soul is unnatural and not in conformity with the design of Eru. How then is the body and spirit now severed during the course of a person's death if it was not according to the will of the one? According to Tolkien's secondary cosmology, there are three distinct scenes in the history of the created universe. First, we have Arda Unmarred, the abstract imagined Arda which never existed, and then followed later by two stages of Arda Mard. Um, first, by the malice of Malkor during the music of the Ainur, before the world was sung into being, and later by a second malice of Malkor through which he provoked the fall of man. The world in which the incarn incarnate elves and men exist is therefore a world marred by evil. Death is therefore not inherently evil, but polluted by the, its marring. The Silmarillion explains that Melkor has cast his shadow upon death and confounded it with darkness and brought forth evil out of good and fear out of hope. The corruption of death is also a concept which um, echoed by Finrod in the Athrabeth, in which he explains that you, Andreth, speak of death and his shadow as if those were one and the same, and as if to escape from the shadow was to escape from death. Death is but the name that we give to something that he tainted, and it sounds therefore evil, but untainted, its name would be good. The debate between Fenrod and Andres hinges upon whether the separation of body and spirit is the result of the incarnates being created into the first marring of Arda, thus, create, uh, thus disrupting the innate uh, harmony of Roa and Fea, or whether the separation is a consequence of the second Arda Maj, and thus the fall of man. Fenrod is of the opinion that the separation became possible due to the first marring of Arda, as elves also suffer the painful separation of body and soul, however unnatural, non-natural that might be. Besides, he doubts Morgoth's capability to change the nature of an entire race, to doom the deathless to death from father unto son, and yet leave to them the memory of an inheritance taken away and the desire for what is lost. Mankind's condition is therefore not a devolution from immortality to mortality, but a change in man's perspective and attitude towards death. Something to be feared and avoided rather than a gift to be accepted willingly. Andres, on the other hand, claims that the change in man is a direct result as of the second malice of Morgoth, which puts, um, which puts human beings into a state of decay. She mentioned that for were it natural for the body to be abandoned and die, but natural for the fear to live on, then there would, be, then there would indeed be a disharmony in man and his parts would not be united by love. The only issue is that men can no longer remember exactly what they did to deserve this cruel fate. She notes that they retain no memory save only legends 
when death came less swiftly and our span still, still far longer, but already there was death. One of these legends is told uh, in the tale of Adanel, a companion tale to the Atrabeth, and recounted to Andres by the older wise woman Adanel, also who married into the house of Beor. The short tale of Adanel, basically a reimagining of the Genesis account, recounts the fall of man through the trickery of Morgoth. Men awaken in a world to the voice of Eru saying that in time you will inherit all this earth, but first you shall be children and learn. Morgoth then appears before the first men and convinces them that the voice of Eru is the voice of darkness and commands them to worship himself rather than the voice. But the, as, a direct, as a direct consequence of this renunciation, the voice of Eru speaks to them only once more, informing them of the following, that ye have abjured me, but ye remain mine. I gave you life, but now it shall be shortened, and each of you in a little while shall come to me and learn who is your Lord, the one ye worship, or I who made him. And thus, men begin to die, and in this way, man's fate was irreparably changed. Whether man's current condition was the result of a devolution as a consequence for sin or the consequence of them being created into Adamard and thus a dis having a disrupted relation harmony of Fro and fear, the result is still the same, the separation of body and spirit at the time of death. While it might have been true that their fate was to leave the boundary, boundaries of the world, their natural state would have been to experience a form of assumption in which men would have taken their bodies with them, such as Enoch and Elijah do in the Bible. This, uh, through this annunciation, um, assumption, um, men would have, would have been spared the painful and unnatural separation of body and spirit. Now, having explored the different natures of men and elves, the immortal and immortal, let's return to the two main characters of our talk, Beren and Luthien, and to the horse of Mandos. According to the Silmarillion, the horse of Mandos are the appointed places of the El Dali, beyond the mansions of the West upon the confines of the world, in which the houseless fear of the elves dwell after they become disembodied. There is also some evidence to suggest that the houseless fiat of men dwell in other halls before they leave the world, as happens to Beren after his death. For the spirit of, man, of Beren at her bidding tarried in the halls of Mandos, unwilling to leave the world until Luthien came to say her last farewell upon the dim shores of the outer sea, whence men that die set out never to return. When Luthien dies of grief, her fear journeys to the halls of Mandos, where she kneels before him and sings to him, and the Silmarillion describes the song as the most fair that ever in words was woven, and the song most sorrowful that ever the world shall hear. The song is so sorrowful. Uh, through her song, she wove two themes of words of the sorrow of the elder and the grief of men, of the two kindreds that were made by Iluvatar to dwell in Arda. And the song is so sorrowful that she moves the Valar Mandos, uh, the god of death, to pity, who had never before been so moved and never would be again. And so um, Mandos summoned Beren, and even as Luthien had spoken in the hour of his death, they met again beyond the Western Sea. But Mandos had no power to withhold the spirits of men uh, that, that were dead within the confines of the world after their time of waiting, and nor could he change the fates of the children of Iluvatar. Therefore, the council, the council of Eru Iluvatar is therefore sought uh, through Manwe, the lord of the Valar, and Luthien is presented with what becomes known as Luthien's choice that she should be released from Mandos and go to Valimar, there to dwell until the world's end among the Valar, forgetting all grief that her life had known, but there Beren could not come. 
Or she might return to Middle Earth and take with her Beren, there to dwell again, but without the certitude of life or joy. Then she would become mortal and subject to a second death, even as he. And ere long, she would leave the world forever and her beauty become only a memory in song. The unique choice offered to Luthien, something Tolkien describes as a direct act of God in his, in his, in his in letter 153, is between living in Valinor without Beren or to divest herself of immortality and return to Middle Earth with Beren and become mortal. She chooses the latter and thus becomes the first of only three elves to share the fate of man, the others being Elros and Arwen, her descendants. Tolkien explains the choice of Luthien and the reincarnation of Beren and Luthien to Middle Earth in the following manner. That Luthien obtains a brief respite in which they both return to Middle Earth alive, though not mingling with other people. A kind of Orpheus legend in reverse, but one of pity, not of inexorability. Now, there are two points to note from this statement. First of all, what does Tolkien mean by Orpheus legend in reverse? In Greek mythology, Orpheus traveled to the underworld to seek his dead wife, Eurydice. Like Luthien, uh, he also had a musical um, audience in which his music softened the hearts of Hades and Persephone, who agreed to allow Eurydice to return with him to the world above on one condition that he should walk before her all the way and not look back until they had both reached the upper world. And Orpheus set off with Eurydice following. However, as soon as he reached the upper world, he immediately turned around in his excitement, for forgetting that both of them needed to be in the upper world for the conditions to be met. As Eurydice had not yet crossed into the upper world, she disappeared a second time and this time forever. The story of Beren and Luthien shares many similarities with um, Orpheus and Eurydice. The journey of the realm to the realm of death, the singing audience, the plea to return the lover, and the condition for the dead lover's return. There is, however, one major difference. The ending of Beren and Luthien's story is a happy one rather than a tragic one, as the lovers get to be reunited in the world above rather than separated once more. Secondly, Beren and Luthien's story is one of pity rather than any inexorability. Now, in inexorability refers to a state of continuing without any possibility of being stopped. The choice of Luthien and the return to Middle Earth is therefore no more than a tactic to delay the inevitable, the true death of Beren and his departure from the world. Now, in Beren and Luthien's story, love motivates faith to reach beyond the boundaries of the known, to rekindle hope in the midst of the uncertain, and for love to turn, and love turns death into a gift and transform defeats <coughs> into victory. Linda Greenwood, uh, who wrote the excellent article, Love, the death, and Gift of Death, makes the following statement. The, the doom of death becomes the gift of death that brings about life. Uh, and I believe that all of this hinges on faith. Faith and, faith and hope are another two concepts covered in the Atrabeth, in which Finra distinguishes between two forms of hope, Estel and Amdir. Amdir is the hope that something is looking up, an expectation of something good, um, which though uncertain, has some foundation in what is known through experience. Estelle, on the other hand, is trust that all of Eru's design must be for his children's joy. It's basically what we consider faith. And this trust is not defeated by the ways of the world, for it does not come from experience, but from our nature and first being. Luthien's love for Beren thus encourages her to trust in her natural Estelle, to trust that the sacrifice she makes by divesting herself of the, her immortality will result in a greater joy. Beren and Luthien's story serves as a call to love someone else enough to be willing to give the gift of death without thought of return. And here, love involves an, an element of sacrifice. 
Luthien surrenders immortality and takes on mortality as a gift of life to Beren. In this case, however, the blessing given in love to Beren becomes almost a curse to Luthien in that she becomes entangled in what is known as the doom of men. Luthien's future death is given to ensure the second life of her dead husband, and her death occurs at the point when she is most alive. Had she not doomed herself, she still would have had long years before her, like Finrod's anal like analogy of the young man in his strength, when, consider when considering the pursuit of Death the Hunter. By choosing the mortal existence, she exchanged the slow but sure-footed hunter for the rapid chase, the home in Arda for a home beyond the confines of the world with Beren. For an immortal life lived alone, for a mortal life lived with her husband, so that the fates of Beren and Luthien might be joined and their paths lead them together beyond the confines of the world. For Luthien, a life without end makes it almost impossible to establish durable and authentic loving relationships, particularly between the mortals and mortals. Therefore, Luthien and later Arwen would rather give up their immortality than live a life without love. So now um, let's come to a short conclusion. And I just want, as a conclusion, I just want to reiterate Berna and Luthien's position within the wider historical narrative of Arda. For the remainder of their lives, Luthien and Beren dwelt together in Osirian in a place called Dorfirn i Guinar, the land of the dead that lived. And they had a son together called Dior, who was the first of the half-elven. Through Dior, the, the line of the half-elven continued through his daughter Alwing, as you can see here. And she in turn gave birth to Elros and Elrond, uh, whom you might, whose name is probably familiar to all of you. Um, these were the sons of Earendil, who himself was a product of the second interracial relationship between elves and human by the, being the son of the human Tuor and the elf princess Idril of Gondolin. Alros and Elrond later chose desperate fates, Alros choosing the, being, um, uh, choosing the fates of men, while Elrond chose the fate of the elves. And these two lines were finally brought together through the marriage of Aragorn and Arwen at the end of The Lord of the Rings. There is therefore a sound reason why Tolkien considered the story of Beren and Luthien to be a fundamental link in the cycle. Thank you all.